Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoy Jenny's talk, which has just uh, just finished airing. It's lovely to see so many people here. Um, for those of you who've been following um, through several different Zoom calls, you're probably absolutely sick of me saying uh, the housekeeping rules at the beginning, um, but I'm going to do it again just for good measure so that everybody um, knows what to expect. So um, you're all at the moment um, muted, hopefully, um, and if I could ask you to keep your videos off unless you're asking Jenny a question, let's just make sure that our audio is good enough for everybody to, um, to hear. Um, if you would like to type a question, you can do so in the chat box, which you can find there's a bar at the bottom of your screen um, and one of the buttons says chat. So you can ask a question that way or you can uh, use the um, raise hand uh, faculty. So to do that, you need to click on the participant um, button, which is on that same bar find yourself and then uh, there should be a little drop down menu next to your name and you can raise your hand um, that way. Um, so I think um, that's all I need to say about um, kind of uh, Zoom etiquette. Um, so it's uh, an absolute pleasure to welcome Jenny uh, live. Um, Jenny, as she said in her talk, started her career um, as the very first Shorten House uh, postdoc um, and is now a professor of 18th century literature at the University of Kent. And she's written absolutely loads of stuff, uh, women's writing, uh, 18th century dress, and um, her project on um, uh, the ladies' magazine um, is something that I know many of us um, who are academics have drawn on and just found incredibly helpful um, in research. Um, so she's been talking about um, her, her most recent book, uh, Jane Austen Embroidery with uh, Alison Larkin. I, I'm um, sure I speak for everybody there in saying that the talk was wonderful. It was so interesting to see all of these um, beautiful images um, and, and, a, and a wonderful book too. And um, before we get going, I should say that we've put a link to um, those of you who um, want to buy the book. There's a, a link on our website on the programme page. So that will take you straight to um, the publisher's website where you can buy it. Um, so I see that we've already um, got a question and we've not got that much time um, in this talk. So I'm going to just jump straight in um, with the questions. So, um, uh, I'm going to unmute the person who would like to uh, ask a question. I think it's um, Maguet. Um, so, hi there. Can you can you hear us? There's a question in the chat box, Kim. I can read it in the yeah, chat that's, box. That's Should right. I just wondered if she wanted to ask out loud, but I'll 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 read it instead. Um, so, the question is about whether you'd encourage even reluctant people to try embroidery in order to better understand Jane Austen's novels. Um, most day nights now except that trying to do Regency dance helps us to get uh, often better. Um, so do you think that needlework is something that allows us to do that as well? Okay, okay so that's, that, yeah, that's Devonie's question. I can, I can see that's um, underneath it. Yes. Um, so um, would I, does it help you understand Jane Austen's novels better? Um, well, so one of the things that I had to do when I was putting the book together and that the publishers were very keen on was that I, that I found opportunities to mention every instance of characters doing embroidery in Jane Austen's novels. And actually, <laughs> there are not a huge number. Hi, Devonie. There's not a huge number of those, as Devonie will well know. Um, in, in the novels, there are, there are discussions of characters being at work and every single one of these um, moments is, is mined and mentioned in the book, as I, was, as I was encouraged to do, and I think so. So, um, in terms of understanding the characters in the novels, I would say not necessarily. However, I think doing embroidery, yes, I think, I think doing embroidery is, is, a, an, is, a, is a wonderful way of trying to access something of the period. It's really hard to divest yourself of the modern conditions in which we do it. And of course, one of the things we have to bear in mind is that most of us who undertake this kind of, you know, decorative embroidery today do it solely and purely because we want to. Um, we, we see it as, a, as a, we, our attitude to leisure, of course, is fundamentally different <laughs> from, from the women, from many women of the past. One of, my, one of the things that I, I've tried really hard to think about, and I'm very interested in, in this book and other projects I'm working on, is trying to kind of dislodge a very entrenched narrative that was around for a long time, um, that sort of only saw domestic needlework, as I think I said in the talk, as a kind of mode of female oppression. It was just something to keep women's hands busy. We, we, Mary Wollstonecraft was very eloquent in her criticism of, 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 of embroidery being used as this kind of repressive technology. Um, Mary Lamb, I cited in the talk. There are plenty of other women who clearly felt the same way. They detested this work. Um, 
but what I'm really what I'm really keenly interested in is all those women who buck that who buck that argument who didn't experience needlework in those ways and I think actually engaging in in it ourselves we can especially with these patterns the fact that these patterns don't have instruction the fact you're not slavishly following very very um, strict guidelines around stitches and colors and threads and this that and the other one of the things that was wonderful about the stitch off was the extraordinary range of interpretations we got and we got that range not just because of the extraordinary creativity of the people involved but we got that range because the patterns permit it right they, they encourage creativity they encourage you can no two workings up of the same pattern would have looked identical and i think doing that kind of work working with the patterns in that way allows us not necessarily to rethink austin's novels as such but allows us to rethink some of these really as I say, for a long time, quite entrenched narratives about women and needlework, which only see it as something that was bad for women, a way of trying to keep them busy when they could have been doing more intellectually engaging things. And you start to envisit, you can start to actually feel, feel the practice as, as a creative practice, as, as, a, as something which is very valuable, not only because of the work that you produce, but also the work it allows your head to do when you slow down time <laughs> in that way that you kind of have to do when you engage in that kind of work. So that's a very roundabout way of saying, yes, of course, I'd encourage everybody to do it, but it's just really lots of fun as much as anything else. But I would particularly encourage people to do it because I think it does open up different kinds of possibilities, opens our minds up to different kinds of possibilities about, about this practice and the kind of stories we've told about it. Well, and I know the book is just out from Dover Publishing in the U.S. And after off of this conversation, I, are you broke Thank up? you. Thank you, Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, definitely. Thank you. Great. Um, our next question is um, from uh, Magret, who's now ready to uh, to ask the question. I think. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, thank you for this beautiful talk. First of all. Um, do you say that Austin borrowed sense and sensibility title and also the character names and plots from the magazine? And if so, who was the writer or who were the writers of these stories published in the magazine? And thank you. That's a lovely question. Thank you. Well, so let me tell you, first of all, that um, it, it is it is it is uh, not my discovery um, that there is this uh, there is this connection between some short fiction in the ladies magazine um, and Jane Austen. Edward Copeland wrote about this some, some years ago. Um, and um, Janine Barker, who I think is in here somewhere, Janine has written about this in her wonderful uh, book too, particularly about the, the character names Willoughby and Brandon. So th these are sort of known facts. Um, the phrase sense and sensibility um, is, 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 is specifically in that short story, The Shipwreck that I mentioned, because the, the, the heroine of it, who is a Miss Brandon, is a woman possessed of sense and sensibility. Um, and there are other kind of uh, linguistic and, and verbal echoes in other short fictions and um, in the ladies magazine and Austen's novels. Uh, I'm interested in other uh, connections between that short story and persuasion actually, but the other one, Guilt Pursued by Conscience, which I mentioned very briefly, has some fantastic stuff. I'm actually writing another book about the ladies magazine at the moment, and I've got quite a lot on this in the, in the final chapter. Um, so yeah, it's really interesting. It's sort of out there in the public domain, but it's just interesting to note. Now your second question, which is who wrote these original stories? I don't know. So one of the things that is frustrating and uh, delightful and sort of makes me quite obsessed in my research about the ladies magazine is that much of its content, in fact, the majority of its content was produced pseudonymously or anonymously. And the authors of each of those fictions that we can, we can trace connections between um, to Austen's novels, none of them have the legal names of the authors on them. And despite my best efforts, and despite the fact that the research project I worked on with two fantastic colleagues, um, Jenny Duplicidi and Conrad Class, did a lot of work on attribution, and we've identified hundreds of authors for the magazine, we haven't been able to identify those authors. So I can't tell you, uh, but all I can tell you is that, um, as others have said before me, Austin was clearly engaging with this fiction, and much more of it actually than has been documented in already published sources. So. Um, it's it's one of the things I've had great fun teasing out in the last chapter of this other book I've just very recently finished. Thank you very much. Great, okay. Um, our next question is from uh, Rosemary Wake, um, who has just taken off mute. Rosemary, are you there? Thank you. Hi there. Hello! <laughs> so nice to see you! <laughs> um, I'm, it, in a way, it's kind of following up from that. 
because um, millinery, for instance, like governessing, was a sort of genteel occupation that impoverished women might be trained to do. So um, I was really wondering about where the, ma where the magazine publishers got their embroidered designers and whether readers contributed. I mean, given that women were taught to be expert in drawing and stitching, um, uh, I wondered if there was, you'd come across any sign that readers were trying to contribute designs just as they were trying to contribute stories and poems? Or did publishers keep a designer under contract or Mrs. Publisher was busy drawing things on the kitchen table of an evening? This is a fantastic question. So I've tried, so some other magazines which leap on the ladies magazine bandwagon, for instance, one that's called the New Ladies Magazine, which in fact plagiarizes much of the original ladies magazine's content. Um, does have that magazine does have a named pattern drawer who's a Frenchman called Charles Stryart um, and there are some other very rare examples where um, pattern drawers are named in periodicals where patterns circulate. To my knowledge the ladies magazine only does this once and it's with a Salisbury pattern drawer um, I've forgotten his name but I can t I could look it up and tell you um, who also, you know, seems to have been the local apothecary and did a thousand other different things, as far as I can tell from his, from, from his uh, records. Um, but in fact, the ladies' magazine doesn't actually name its pattern drawers. When it first is published in, in 1770, um, there is a big brouhaha because the pattern drawers in, in London in particular are livid with the magazine for undercutting them by making these patterns available at half the price that they, they would have charged for them and mass circulating them and it, there's a big war of words that's played out in the newspapers around this um, but unfortunately none of them name any names um, so it's, it's very frustrating in terms of actual internal evidence about whether or not um, readers sent in patterns there's no off the top of my head there's no internal evidence that that is the case however there which is odd which is odd as you say because so much of the magazine is um, it's in a kind of responsive mode a lot of the time, so a lot of its content is driven by its readers. Um, and certainly they produced, they printed songs that were based on, on, on airs that readers had written, as well as printing poetry that readers had written and so forth. But what there is, is there are plenty of examples where the editor writes that a, that a, a woman reader has written requesting particular patterns for certain objects or particular kinds of designs. There's plenty of evidence of that, but sadly I have no evidence either of any female pattern drawers whose work was used in the magazine or that readers were actually directly influencing this. But I, I'm on the, I've been trying to find this out for many years now and um, keep hitting brick walls. It's really odd that they're so coy about this really, where they get them from. <laughs> It's intriguing because you'd have thought that um, people who were proud of their work would have tried that route as well. Yes, yes. And we know that we know. I mean, you, you often find, um, you know, in, in letters from the period, you'll often find people sort of marginal do doodles and things or even quite elaborate doodles around the side of the page where women are drawing patterns for the for their correspondence. So women are doing are engaged in this kind of activity, coming up with designs. Um, all the time. But yes, I just can't join the dots between that kind of practice and what's actually going in the magazine much as I would really like to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we've probably only got time for one or two more questions. So if I don't get to you in the chat, if you want to ask your question on Twitter, um, then I'm sure um, at some point Jenny will be able to um, come back to it. But I'm going to go to um, Colette Davies now um, to ask her question. Um, hiya, uh, thank you for a really interesting talk. Um, I was just wondering, because you said that it was really strange for, well, it was far less likely for the patterns to still be included, but you've managed to collect about, was it 60 or like even more than that now? Um, do you know, can you tell anything about the those magazine editions that still have the patterns in them? Are they awful patterns? What, do they have a specific ownership history? I'm just, it's all speculation, I'm just curious. Yeah, it's a really, really great question. No, I mean, I've actually got the, the 1796 one that um, I bought. This is a half year, it looks like that. There's nothing about it, there's no, no inscription in it. I don't know who owned it. There's nothing in it to suggest um, that there's anything particularly special uh, about it, except that the only thing, other thing I would say is that one of the things that's lovely about this is it also has pretty much all of its engravings and also has pretty much all of its fold out song sheets which the magazine published each month too wow that's that's rare too 
So what, what, I, what tends to be the case is that the copies of the magazine, which have got some or all of the patterns in, tend to have other of the, vis the, the um, other non-text-based media in them. So like the song sheets and, and the illustrations. Whereas often, often what you'll, I've got many copies of the ladies' magazine downstairs, which have none of that in, like not even a, not a frontispiece that might have the odd engraving, but hardly anything. Because of course people use them. I mean, they use the engravings too for scrapbooking. They cut bits of text out for commonplacing, you know, so they were, they were, they were used and abused in all sorts of ways by readers. So no, I mean, I, I, I wish there were some interesting stories to tell about particular issues I've got. Um, but I mean, I've, I've also got a single issue here. This is a, a, an 1816 one, which has its um, has untrimmed pages. This has its pattern um, in it as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I have never seen an 1816 volume of the magazine which has this in it. <laughs> so, oh, maybe it was very popular. <laughs> maybe who knows who knows but um so, so much i mean so much of what's in here gets lost when it makes its way into a volume like this typically and the, the patterns are just the most usual casualty of all of them it's the most regular casualty of all of them so no other than just that you know ones that have the patterns in tend to have other stuff in them as well i think is the only distinction i could make really okay cool thank you very much thank you uh Pierre, do you think we have time for one more Yes, I think we've got time for one more. I think so. Okay, um, I'm going to um, just go with um, Denise uh, Kretsch because I think that you might be able to answer that. Um, yeah, <laughs> relatively easy. I, I don't know if that's relevant. Oh, about know. the hierarchy of handicrafts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, Denise, that's a great question. And yes, there is, absolutely. There are definitely hierarchies of, 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 of um, needlework. I mean, there's even, it's not, just, it's, not just hand, it's not just a hierarchy of handicrafts, but even within needlework itself, there's a very distinct, um, distinctive kind of hierarchy from the, you know, the most sort of technically accomplished decorative needlework down to plain sewing right down at the bottom. Um, it's a, if, you, if you want to get a wonderful feel for the kinds of hierarchies that are at play, I would suggest to everyone to read Francis Burney's fantastic novel, The Wanderer, which is the only one of Burney's novels that is published at the same time that Austen is publishing, because the heroine of that novel, Juliet, goes on a wonderful sort of spiral of downward mobility, which is signalled in all sorts of ways. But one of the ways it's signalled is by she starts off as a very sort of accomplished needlewoman who can do her needlework in private. Um, and ends up because of the financial misfortune that she finds herself in having to increasingly sell herself and sell her skills down to doing much more increasingly lowly forms of needlework so if you want to get a feel for how how finely calibrated that hierarchy was i would definitely suggest that novel but yes there is abso absolutely a hierarchy and why you do it in what conditions you do it whether you're paid for doing it or not paid for doing it all of these things matter very much oh that's great jenny thanks no problem, thank you. Thank you. Um, so I'm aware we've left loads of questions unanswered. Um, as I said before, if you want to take the conversation over onto Twitter, that would be marvellous. Um, but we need to wrap things up here. Um, so I'll just reiterate um, a, a massive, massive thank you to Jenny um, for being with us. Um, it was just lovely, lovely to see you. Um, and I hope that, um, I think this talk will chime really nicely with the next one, um, which is Hillary's. And I hope that the conversation will carry on um, into the evening so th thank you very much for joining us um take care everybody and uh yeah we shall uh, see you again soon thank you very much <laughs>